Thank you. So, um, uh, my name's Mark, uh, and uh, from Canarkle. Uh, you are here for a workshop, right, which is the Juju workshop. And those who don't know, Juju is technology that actually underpins a lot of stuff that, um, if you were here this morning, you saw me do a very quick demo. Um, Juju is a lot of the technology that underpins that. So, um, and this is, uh, this session is, if I can get this in. Nope. Let's try again. Come on. Thank you, Dustin. In fact, no, I don't know even because otherwise it's going to be painful. So there's there's you run Linux laptops. This is how you change your display when you connect to a projector. Mm -hmm. It's uh, not currently part of the uh, the planned demo, but let's try that anyway. Press uh and drag. -huh. There we go. There we go. Get rid of that. There we go. So let me start off by looking at the cloud. So this is actually the exact same cloud that we built earlier on. Uh, I know that it was like a two-minute demonstration. Um, and I just went through and clicked all the defaults, because that's what you do when you do live demos. Um, so in front of a big audience. So, but this is actually, and you'll have to take my word for it, this is actually the thing that we built. And so you'll see, uh, if you remember this morning, we built two availability zones. Uh, we added a number of nodes. And so here we can see that we've got two availability zones, 11 nodes, 66 cores, total of whatever that is, RAM associated with it, and some disk, right? It's only a demo system, not a real, real live big cloud that you'd run real live big workloads on, but enough to be able to see it. And you'll see that it's been up and running for a little while, so we can see some of the utilization on it uh, in terms of CPU, uh, the RAM, uh, and other bits and pieces running on it, right? And so the point that uh, Jesse was making afterwards, install, blah, so what? This gives you some operational insight into how the health of your cloud. Right? Nowhere near as detailed as a um, grown-up monitoring system, or nowhere near as, as functionally capable for managing your cloud as Horizon. But as a systems management tool, if we were looking at all of our different systems and computers that we have associated um, with our infrastructure, all these different components that we have, it's, going, it's always dangerous to go and click one randomly, but we're going to have a look at the other, <laughs> other system here, uh, information about the server that's running, the um, uh, security status of that, if there are any patches outstanding, if there are any... Uh, administrative tasks that we need to perform on that. You'll see details about this. Apologies for the resolution. I could probably fix that, but I won't. But you'll see all the all the hard information relating to that, and we can go and uh, see, for example, um, have a look in monitoring, get some information about loads, etc. Right. So this is not designed to be very detailed management of our cloud, but it's designed from an operator's point of view to give us a very clear simple picture of okay what's the state of my cloud is there any red lights that i need to need to see right use it in conjunction with a different monitoring tool use it in conjunction with your dashboard um dashboard right this is the openstack dashboard horizon for the cloud that we built this morning so what happens when you switch networks moving between rooms There we go. So I'm not going to demo the Horizon dashboard to you, other than to, everyone's seen this before, right? Um, so you probably know it better than I do. But we show um, just a couple of things on here. One, the number of hypervisors that we have running, right? So after the thing this morning, once the cloud was stood up, uh, we added some load onto this just to make it a little more interesting. Uh, so you can see that we've got uh, quite a lot of resources associated with this. Um, all good. If we go and have a look at uh, instances, added some instances there running as well. So we can go and have a look at, they're all Ubuntu small instances just for good measure. Um, so we can see uh, some of that instance overview all set up and running, right? 
And that was a nice thing. That I didn't have to do anything. Obviously, I launched these instances, but all the network config was already set up. That was determined when we built that this morning. Um, all of the uh, 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 placing of the, all the different services on all the different machines, that was all done for us. Right? So just wanted to make the point that wasn't just some screen cam or whatever, some screenshots that he saw this morning. That was a real live system that has built a real live cloud that is now running real live instances. Okay. And uh, despite having product in my title, I'm not an overly technical person. So the fact that I managed to do that is, uh, is, is, is uh, hopefully proof that it is relatively simple. Um, thank you. I wasn't asking for the applause. But, um, but what we wanted to do now was to, was to kind of do the magicians. Is that very impressive? Let's see how that trick was done, right? So what is it that it's doing all the work? It's good that it's been presented as being very simple, right? Uh, that, that somebody, you know, that, that often wears a suit can manage to do it. But how, how do we do that, right? What are, the, what are the components under, you know, we think about our beautiful swan going across the lake, right? Let's have a look at the feet that are paddling like crazy. Uh, to make all of this all of this magic happen, and um, I'll start off. Well, actually, I, truly speaking, I'm going to start off by handing over to my colleague here. But um, the first step to doing that is how do we manage the hardware, right? How do we automate provisioning that hardware and doing the interesting things? Uh, that we use a technology called Metal as a Service, MAS, and Dustin, uh, who's a MAS product manager at Canonical, is going to walk you through some of that. Howdy, my name's Dustin. I'm the Texas version of Mr. Baker, um, <laughs> uh, and you don't want to hear my British accent. Um, so yeah, so 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 Mark's demo earlier this morning uh, was the autopilot of Maz, which is uh, it's a it's a wizard, it's a GUI. Click click click. Wait a little while. Um, thankfully, we had lunch uh, after that little while. OpenStack has stood up. Um, there's really, really um, three pieces fundamentally underpinning. Uh, that 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 autopilot. So I'm assuming anyone here wants to see what's happening behind the curtain, right? What's what's the magic behind something like that? Um, so we'll start at the very ground layer and we'll work our way up where we'll say OpenStack is sitting on top of all of that. So this is a little too small, so we're gonna blow this up some. So this is the first piece. This is mass metal as a service, and it could even go a little bigger than that, right? Still, still not quite readable. Um, change the, change the display, right? uh, that's all right. We'll, we'll, we'll run with this. Metal as a service. So Maz is uh, this is one of the products that, that I've managed for Canonical for some time. I was a, one of the first developers on this, actually, uh, several years ago. Um, there's nothing innovative about Maz. I'll, I'll just come outright and start there. Maz is not uh, an innovative product. Any sysadmin worth his salt has set up Maz themselves over and over and over again. And that's because Maz is really a collection of... DHCP and DNS and Pixie and TFTP um, and a database to handle a whole bunch of machines um, and then what it takes to power those machines on. That's not innovative, right? You've obviously set that up before if you've run a lab. If you've had to install more than five servers in a lab, you've set up a Pixie server to, to do that for you, right? Um, but what Maz is, is it's a really beautiful way of doing that. You're literally apt get install Maz away from having having this interface and being able to, to instantly deploy to bare metal, instantly deploy Ubuntu, CentOS, Windows, SUSE, Debian, Red Hat to one or a thousand systems with the, with the click of a button. That's, that's what Maz is. Um, we started out with Maz you know, working exclusively with Ubuntu and over the last couple of years our customers have actually um, have actually funded the development of Maz deploying other operating systems as well. Um, that's, that includes CentOS, that includes Windows, and others. Um, for the sake of this demo, everything we've done has been on Ubuntu, um, and we certainly only, only deploy OpenStack on Ubuntu, at least within Canonical. Um, but there are use cases for Maz actually deploying other operating systems uh, to bare metal. It takes about two to five minutes, depending on the, on the, on the OS, to actually deploy those systems. Um, so with, with Landscape, with that graphical front end that Mark used to deploy with that autopilot, under the covers at one layer is the metal as a service layer, which is taking care of selecting the machines to deploy, 
turning those machines on remotely, creating a Pixie instance, um, booting those systems over Pixie, booting that into an ephemeral environment, which is just a, a temporary environment where that system comes up and then it receives its instructions. It receives its, its, its commands, uh, which, which includes wget of an image, dd that image to the disk, well, excuse me, format that disk, F, uh, partition that disk, uh, dd that image to disk, and then reboot the system in its new pristine environment. Once that happens, then the next layer takes over, and that's something we call Juju. I'll get to that in just a second. Let me give just a really brief tour of, of Maz here. This is, uh, this is logged into uh, the, the Maz server. Actually, I can see this right here. Um, you'll see that we've got the dozen or so machines that, uh, that mark 17, excuse me, 17 nodes that, that mark deployed OpenStack 2. They're all in a deployed state. I can select any one of these nodes and see a, a, the, the, the typical information about that, that machine. It's just demographic information. How many CPUs, how much RAM, um, how, much, how much disk. Uh, we're still loading. We're over a VPN tunneled connection over Wi-Fi out to the tethering through my phone, somehow making its way into a lab in London. <laughs> um, so uh, just bear with me as, as we attempt to... Uh, attempt to, to demonstrate this. Um, what's actually, you know what we, we're going to do? We're going to look at Maz closer on this box, which is sitting sitting right here. So we're going to switch over to a different system. Um, this is the same Maz, or I'm sorry, this is a different instance of Maz. It's the same technology, but instead of being in a lab in London against Xeon rack-mounted hardware, we're actually talking about this machine sitting right here. So I'm back. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, we're actually talking about this system. This system actually has 10 physical nodes, 10 real independent nodes, each one with their own CPU and RAM and network and disk. There's five on this side of the box, five on that side of the box. They're four inch by four inch Intel nooks. Desktop PCs, you wouldn't put these in a lab, but they're fantastic for an environment like this where we can plop one on a desk, plug it into the wall, stand up OpenStack in about 15, 15 minutes on real hardware. Um, you'll see this is that, that Maz, and we're not going to have to you know, go over, over the interwebs to talk to these machines, so hopefully just a click and this works. Or, yeah, there we go. Um, so we've got a machine up. This machine, we can see its, its architecture. It's got four cores, 16 gigs of RAM, 270 gigs of storage, and then some very important information here, which is the power type. So Maz knows how to turn on machines. It knows how to remotely power on systems. Uh, these systems have something called Intel AMT, but in your lab, in your data center, you're going to see something that looks a lot more like, if I click edit, a lot more like these power management. HP, ILO, uh, Cisco UCS, Versh, uh, IPMI. Um, these are the common technologies that are used to remotely power systems on and off. Uh, Mass has a very pluggable little driver set. Writing a new power manager is about 50 lines of, of Python code. Um, and then all you need to do once you have selected the power type, you give it the information as to how to turn, how to find that machine, either by MAC address or IP address or both. And then a password is typically, a t password or certificate is typically there. I'll also see that of those 12 nodes, there are some nodes that are in the, the ready state. So you should see five lights, five LEDs powered on in the front of that box. We've got another five lights that are, that are not powered on. So what I'm going to do as an introduction to our next tool, the next layer up in that stack, that's Juju, the orchestration system, I've got a second open stack. This is not the one that Mark deployed this morning on stage. This is another one that we deployed a few minutes ago. Um, I'm actually going to... Mm. That's not what I was looking for. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, so this is Juju. I'll, I'll explain this in just a second, but the first thing that I want to do... Is it? Yeah. Okay, that's all right. Um, so what I'm going to do, I have three units here. Hopefully you can see this. I have three units of Nova Compute running, right? I want to scale Nova Compute up. I want to take those three units, and I want to change that to... five units. And I'm going to confirm that. 
and I'm going to commit. And I'm going to add five units of Nova to this system. I'm going to click confirm, and then in a couple of minutes, we'll start seeing lights power on on this box as Maz, as Juju asks Maz to provision more units. And we'll see those systems turn on. They'll each need an operating system installed on them, and then we'll start adding, and then Juju will start adding, um, adding OpenStack to it. So, so Juju, let's talk a little bit more about Juju. What you may see, and I'm going to avoid the key combo that keeps opening up Mr. Baker's last pass here. <laughs> um, what you should see on the screen are uh, a lot of logos. And if I, if I were to zoom in a little bit, hopefully you'll recognize some of these components. Uh, certainly the Nova Cloud Controller, controller Nova Compute, here's Neutron. We're running an NTP service to keep all of these systems time in sync. We've got Celometer. Um, we have a MongoDB, which Celometer depends on. We have a MySQL and a RabbitMQ, a message in queue and a stateful database. Um, we have Heat, um, a templating engine. We have Glance, which is storing our, our images. We've got Sender, providing block storage. We have Ceph, providing the back end of that block storage. Um, Ceph has a couple of components to it, um, and as does Sender. Uh, I'm sure I've probably skipped something in there. Oh yeah, Keystone, right? Of course we need, of course we need Keystone. Um, the sum total of all of that looks something like this, and these icons are, are very drag and droppable. The lines in between the different services in indicate the dependencies, the different services that need to talk to other services to get their work done. For instance, Keystone needs a database. It needs a MySQL. Keystone needs. Uh, a RabbitMQ, um, and typically, when you, if you were to install this by hand, you'd have to establish all of those relationships yourself. You'd need to go in and edit Keystone's configuration file, um, or perhaps uh, you know you'd use a you'd use a, a, a configuration management utility to try to keep track of all of that. Well, that's that's ultimately what Juju is doing for you here. It's established all of those relationships. It's maintaining those relationships. It's tracking the health of those relationships, and it knows how well that system's working. I'll take just a second to point over here, and we'll, we should see uh, some of those lights powering on. You can see the top light is, uh, is, is power, and the bottom light is hard disk activity, and so those, those bottom two machines, I happen to know, are right in the middle of that uh, one gigabyte DD to disk. So it is just you know, throttling that, that, uh, uh, that IO is just thrashing that SSD right now. Um, in a couple of seconds, that, that install of the operating system will be complete. It'll reboot, and then it will start receiving the, the Nova Compute instances. Now, in this, um, in this OpenStack, if I go to the Hypervisors tab, I'll see that we, we currently have three hypervisors um, here. Uh, in, a, in a few minutes, we should see that three go up to a four, five, six, seven, and eventually uh, an, an eighth as well. Um, so Juju is what sits on top of Maz. Maz takes care of provisioning the operating system uh, onto the hardware, and its job is done when there's an OS on that hardware and it can present a new physical resource to Juju to then do what it needs to do with it. Um, Juju's job is arguably the, the harder part. And where I said Maz is not terribly innovative, you know, it's that same, those same core services you've put on every rack in every data center for the last, last two decades. Juju is very new. It's very different. There are very few things out there that, that can do what Juju does, that look anything like uh, what Juju looks like. Um, and so we're, we're very proud. We're very proud of what Juju is able to do. Um, the OpenStack is, of course, the, the topic, the subject of today's, today's meetup. Um, but we tomorrow we'll take that um, across the country and we'll deploy Kubernetes on that same box using Juju. We'll deploy Hadoop on that same box using Juju. We'll deploy a, a media transcoding cluster um, on that box using Juju. And by that box, I literally do mean that orange box, but the other piece of Juju in that not only can it deploy very complex workloads such as OpenStack in a matter of minutes, uh, Juju can also deploy very complex workloads to any public cloud, to any private cloud, or to bare metal. And what we're showing here is the Juju and Maz interface, Juju deploying OpenStack to bare metal. 
But we can take those same workloads, and Juju abstracts the logic of providers. We call them cloud providers. And Juju's API can talk to Amazon, can talk to Google Compute, it can talk to Rackspace and Azure, and actually talk to OpenStack. And that's really one of the most exciting aspects of Juju, is not only do we use it to deploy OpenStack, literally, but we can also use Juju to deploy complex services into an OpenStack. So we can provide Juju the credentials necessary to then deploy Hadoop, for instance, into an OpenStack, Kubernetes, for instance, into an OpenStack. Um, I don't think we'll have time to, to, to take you down that journey just yet today, but we've got some fantastic resources on YouTube where we've demonstrated that you know, over and over uh, and over again. Um, the lights we have, we see are blinking here. There's a lot of hard disk activity going on right now. I happen to know that that, that hard disk activity is very indicative of Juju establishing those relationships. All of the relationships that are necessary for Nova Compute to work. So if I zoom in a bit here and we look at the Nova, the Nova Compute charm and we look at those lines that are attached to it, I can see exactly what Nova Compute requires to work. It requires an NTP client, a connection to an NTP client. Um, it also requires uh, a, a, or Celometer is used to track the resource usage from Nova. I can see Nova is also associated with, I happen to know that these down here are the, the MySQL and the messaging queue. I can see Nova attached to the Nova Cloud Controller. Of course, Nova Cloud Controller is going to request uh, actions of the Nova Compute Engine. And I can see that it's attached to Ceph because in Ubuntu OpenStack, in our reference platform of OpenStack, I'm going to look here just for a second at our, our resource utilization. How are these services deployed on these systems? And I can see that every single service, and I do literally mean every single one of these services, with the exception of Nova Compute itself, which is our hypervisor, every service is running in a Linux container. Right, and so I've been here in Seattle all week at ContainerCon, and there's lots of discussion about you know how can we get things into containers uh, as quickly as possible, and and I've talked to both startups and enterprises both about um, you know they're they're telling me that they're you know working on moving their 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 critical infrastructure, many of their services, some of them from virtual machines or from hardware into containers, and I, I would just like to show you that that's exactly how we deploy OpenStack. Every single service, as you can see over here on the right, every one of these services is uniquely positioned in its own Linux container. And what we get out of that is a very self-contained atomic view of each service that can be live migrated and migrated around. So if we needed to evacuate machine 5 because we, we needed to upgrade its RAM or add a new hard disk or something to it, we could take each one of these services and move them off of that machine onto another machine using container migration. Um, container live migration. So let's take a, a quick look back at our services. We can see that we're almost done. Um, I happen to see one machine hasn't powered on yet, and that's actually uh, part of the demo because uh, you know there's there's hardware failures in in labs. That's exactly what happens in in a lab in a real life scenario. And so if I go back to Maz, I can see. Um, I can see node 5 is still in that ready state. Node 5 never, never got powered on. Um, and so what I would want to do at this point is take node 5 and I'm going to take an action. I'm going to mark node 5 broken. And that's going to park node 5 in a special state that keeps Maz or Juju or you, the system administrator, from doing something with node 5. Uh, in that that's a machine that's that's not ready to uh, it's not ready to be used at this point, and so you know you can mark it, um, take it out of out of out of commission for a minute while you while you debug and see what's going on with that system. Um, so if I come back to Juju at this point, you can see Nova Compute has gone completely green. We've got now got eight units of Nova Compute. Uh, we had four hyper or three hypervisors before. This sometimes takes a minute to propagate and. I bet my credential has expired here.
we log back in and we can now see we've got, we have scaled up our OpenStack. With a matter of clicking a button, we said, OpenStack, I want you to go bigger. I need more compute. I need more storage. And we've taken those three hypervisors now to, to eight hypervisors. Mr. Baker, I think that's what I have. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, questions? Yes, sir. Can I scale down? To Can I scale down? Uh, sure. So, um, you know, you'd want to certainly evacuate these these systems. Um, you would. That's uh, that's that's usually not supported through the GUI. You would do that on the command line. But yes, you can remove units. That's a juju remove unit. I should probably say that I I would have normally tested the crowd to see if if you wanted to see all of this work happening uh, on the command line or on the in the GUI. But everything and anything that I would have done in the GUI here, I could have done through uh, through the command line. And now I'm on a British keyboard and completely lost. Um, so this is this is a a textual view, a, a basically a YAML view of everything you saw in the GUI. So I can see all of these agents, um, where they're running. I can see that some of them are physical machines. I can see some of them are Linux containers, 5LXC slash 0. Um, that's, that's the list of resources. Um, after that list of resources, I can see the services. And here I can see Celometer and where it's located, how many units there are. Um, I can see the Celometer agent, Ceph, uh, how many units? There's one, two, three, four units of Ceph. Uh, if I scroll all the way down to Nova Compute, uh, there's heat. It just goes on and on. I mean, this is what you're seeing is a JavaScript view of this, you know, um, very DevOpsy command line. Uh, Juju add unit is how you would add a unit, uh, and then of course we could. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do with with Juju, um, but uh, and you can see some information about the other. Providers, the places we can Juju deploy, HP Cloud, OpenStack, for instance. Um, but yes, that's a, that's a good question. For API for Absolutely, absolutely. It's an open API. Juju is 100% free and open source software. There's no license required for Juju whatsoever. Um, freely available. It's written in Go. It's easy to easy and fun to hack on. It's very fast and modern, cloudy. Um, the API itself is completely open. Juju.ubuntu.com right here is the place to go to, to read and, and learn more about it. So that's Maz, that's Juju. I said there were three pieces. Uh, the third piece, and this should take us all the way back to where, uh, where Mark started with, with, uh, with you in the keynote, um, is, of course, Landscape. So Landscape, Maz at the bottom, Juju is service orchestration in between. Landscape is the, the next level. Landscape is the systems management and provides this this sort of wizard view, this autopilot view of your cloud. What are the resources in the cloud? Not what's the hardware underneath, not how are the, how are the services orchestrated together, but what is the cloud uh, that you've deployed here? Um, so often when I'm, when I'm dealing with my OpenStack cloud, I've typically got four tabs open. Um, the, 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 the launch pad, sorry, the um, horizon, of course. Where's your horizon tab? Horizon, number one. Uh, landscape, number two, um, Juju, number three, and then uh, Maz, number four. And across those four, I've got a view at any layer I want of the cloud. What are the instances in the cloud doing? Um, what does my the management of that cloud look like? What are the services deployed in that cloud look like? And what's the bare metal at the very bottom doing? Does that make sense? Any other questions? Yeah, one other question. Yep. You said that everything Mm -hmm. Those services. Mm -hmm. is, uh, is that like LXC based? Or? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's a great question. So uh, if you're familiar with container technology, there's a few different alternatives out there. Um, LXC is the container technology that Canonical has been working on since about 2010. So we've got you know a good five years experience with that. We've recently extended LXC with the LexD project, and the two work together very closely. So LexD. We treat it as a hypervisor. It's ultimately a hypervisor that manages containers that run in that hypervisor. LexD is another API. It's a REST-based API that manages all of the containers on that system, and that's, that's ultimately what we're using. Individual containers you might call LXC. Um, the command line client that talks to the daemon is also LXC. The key difference, though, between... Uh, I'll, I'll just take this, this moment to mention this, but the key difference between LXC uh, and LexD, ultimately, and Docker 
is that, and we partner with Docker very closely for deploying for deploying applications and, and services in, into a container, okay? LexD presents a container that looks a lot more like a virtual machine, looks a lot more like a machine. And because of the services that we typically deploy as OpenStack services, those services might be on bare metal, they might be in a virtual machine, they might be in a container. For us, that LXC type machine-like view of a container is seamless how we use it, right? So the difference is that in a Docker container, you typically only run a single process in that Docker container. It's MongoDB, or it's user bin MySQL, or user bin Apache. There's one and only one process inside of that container. As it turns out, the way our, our the way these services that, that we're working with in OpenStack are, are constructed, they expect something that looks more like a system, right? They expect a system D, a, a, you know, an S bin, a NIT to actually boot that system, a syslog that's, that's taking care of the logs and perhaps shipping them off to a remote server, an SSH client so that you, know, you can get into that system and do some work on that system. Um, so yes, that's a great question. Those are, in fact, all LXC containers. Sure. sure. So, but in your, in, in your implementation here, they're more almost like a, like a, like a Solaris zone in that, in that sense. That they're Absolutely. Like a complete uh, yes. system then rather than just one process. Yep, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And that gives us the portability of deploying those services just as easily into a container as a VM, as a machine, because those machine containers, those Solaris zones or BSD jail like container, looks like a system, you know? Um, so we don't have to make major changes or any changes really at all to that workload to make it Dockerized or, you know, yeah, smart for being containerized, yeah. right? So the, the rampant popularity of Docker actually has skewed people's microphone thing, the skewed people's view of containers, right? Containers like Solaris Zones, absolutely. It was my rooted environment. I can do whatever I like with it. Um, because Docker, so many people think about Docker now as creating immutable containers and, you know, just kill and create kind of thing. It's uh, uh, some of the, the preaching we're having to do now is actually other types of containers, right? And, and, and there's definitely benefits to using both. So just to kind of finish up, because uh, we're nearly out of time, was uh, all the things that Dustin has just showed you there, Maz engaging with the hardware, Juju talking to Maz to be able to spin services up on that hardware, is all, if I pinch some HP terminology, under cloud, right? So this is how we are using these technologies to um, deploy and manage and scale, as you saw, hopefully, um, <clears throat> the cloud itself, OpenStack itself. But somebody this morning made the point I think it was Alan Clark, wasn't it, right? It's the services that matter, right? End user services are what matter. So the great thing is, is that here in our, in our, um, our environment, our landscape environment, you see this couple of key points here. Download your cloud credentials, download Juju configuration, right? So if I just go and click on this and open here. Um, did I just save that or did I open it? Let's go and have a look again. And we get it. Oh, it's because that's already open. I don't want that at all. Uh, 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 there we go. So get rid of that. So this is our environment, right? This is basically a YAML file that says this is if we want to be able to go and access the cloud that's running with Juju, right? These are this is the information that we need to save. We save it in an environments.yaml file, actually in a .juju directory in the local machine. Um, and that would then allow me to take this environment, right? But instead of pointing at the undercloud, where was the, let's find that one. Yes, this environment, instead of pointing at the undercloud, so that we're looking at our services, we will get a nice blank canvas, right? There's nothing that's running in our cloud today. I'm going to cheat. Always best to be honest when you're cheating. Uh, I'm going to shut down my VPN here and reach out into a slightly different environment, just so I can show this very, very quickly. So uh, you can go and do this in real time as well, if you, if you so wish. To go to jujucharms.com, um, and uh, you will see here demo. It's going to give us this blank environment, right? Um, you'll see here, if I search for OpenStack, this is not connected to any back end. Right? This is why it's really fast to demo stuff, and I don't have to mess around saving those YAML files and doing that reconfig, which will undoubtedly fail when you only have two minutes to do it. So, but also, you can do the same thing. Anyone mm. can play with this canvas and get a feel for it. It's, it's, it's globally available. Anyone can play with this canvas with no commitment whatsoever. 
So I again search for my OpenStack. God, this is so slow. Um, and you'll see here I've got individual components, so the components that we use to deploy OpenStack. I should, touch word, if I scroll down, see here, OpenStack base. This is what we call a bundle. It's a collection of the different services, right? So that you don't need to go and plug those in yourselves. So here's a bundle that we've already created. It already has all of this defined with all the relations. Great, I'm still talking about the undercloud. What's much more interesting, and there's kind of a, let's link back to the previous session, if you were in that, the database session. Um, say I want to go and deploy a database into my existing environment, into, into my cloud, right? Let's go and choose, sorry, someone give me a database. I'm, I was going to choose MySQL, let's do something else. You can, oh, thank you. If you said Vertica, then I would have cried. But, um, <laughs> but uh, Oracle. Um, but let's go, Mongo. So um, go and search for Mongo. We'll find MongoDB. There we go. It's been deployed a whole heap of times. If we go and click on that, this is this definition of what happens when we say deploy a Mongo is determined by a template or a def, uh, uh, something that we call a charm, actually, which is best practice. You can see um, a config of all of those, you know, so parameters that we can pass in real time when we deploy Mongo. I know very little about Mongo. Um, uh, and we can go and see all of the different things that we can configure with Mongo. We can go and see that the code that goes to make up what happens when we do certain things, like you know, create replica sets or do other bits and pieces with it that, um, that happens there. So if I, but I go ahead and add Mongo to my canvas. Um, I ha go ahead and commit. It's going to ask me a question. What do I want to do? I can go and automatically place it, because this is not connected to a real environment, limits what I could show. But if I already had running machines, I could go and choose where to place it. It's exactly the same as Dustin said, it would wrap it in a container and go and deploy it, uh, deploy it on a physical machine. Say so it's a kind of a moot point when it, it's not a real demo, but um, go ahead and deploy that. And it, because it's a demo, it happens super fast, which is nice, but it goes and deploys that service. and so. Uh, if we go and find if we go and find something we could connect to Mongo, that's just going to be a challenge. Cilometer. Yeah. Okay. Cilometer. We could probably find it out from. Yeah. Build relation. Build relation. And does it do that? No. Uh, where's that from? Let's go into the charm. Do this never go off off piece on your demo? Um, <laughs> yeah. So you go and have a look at the running unit MongoDB. You can go and have. Bah, bah, bah. Okay. We're going to have a look at the code. It might even tell us uh, config, read me. No, it doesn't do that. All right. In the interest of time, we'll just go back to So imagine you had an application that wasn't Solometer um, that did work very happily with Mongo. Um, go back to there. Oh, come on. Let's take the easy way out. My canvas, commit, uh, automatically place, and confirm. And then exactly in the same way, thank you. So I need that box to disappear because of the resolution. It's messing up my screen. Uh, and let's go and choose Silomisa here. So let's go and deploy that, add to my canvas, and commit. Exactly the same process. Um, goes ahead and deploys. To add the relation between the two, it'll say, yep, I can add those. What happens at that point when I hit commit? All determined again by that config. So what happens when I connect a service that can use a Mongo database with a Mongo database is all determined by this charm. Who writes the charms? You do. Right? So there's about 100 and 200 something? I don't know. There's a ton of them now. Yeah, there's a ton of them now. So most of the ones, certainly open source technologies, all the things that you know and love or loathe, but you know, MySQL and Redis and Mongo and Nginx and all of those good things, right? There are charms for those. Um, we work with open source community to develop them. We're not the best people to write a Mongo charm. We had the MongoDB people write parts of that and certainly verify the work that was done. Uh, the WordPress charm, for example, was written and verified by one of the largest um, WordPress users around, et cetera, et cetera. OpenStack charms, we pretty much take the lead on. Because uh, because we do so, um, but you can see how you can very quickly start to build 
a complex application architecture with very many different running services. I will finish on this last piece, which is here we have export. So once we've designed our application architecture, we can export the definition of that um, uh, as, a, as a YAML file. It's going to open up in my thing here. So we'll see that. This is the definition of our bundle. You see that we've got Solometer connected with uh, MongoDB, those relations in place. So if I wish to be able to take this architecture definition and export it from my OpenStack database, import it into Azure or AWS or some other environment, it makes it very, very easy to do that. We don't we see, don't see so much of that. What we do see is people designing things and then flipping between dev, test, prod, staging, et cetera, right? Using the API. We're out of time. Uh, any, any questions at all? Yeah, um, sure. You know, private term repo? Yes. 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 Uh, yes. Yep. Confidently. Yes. Yes. Alrighty. So um, that concludes all of our stuff that today. Please be very kind on their forms, right? Our bonuses and commissions depend upon it. So, um, <laughs> and otherwise we won't get home. Otherwise, uh, Arturo is going to be here um, for a while. Dustin and I have to have to shoot out now, but. Uh, if um, you have any other questions you want to catch, then uh, please, I'm mark.baker at canonical.com or at Mark Baker, Mark A. Baker on Twitter. So any questions or feedback, um, we can give you our postal address if you want to send us checks, all that kind of thing. So thank you very much.